A little while back, I covered an application called Lab, which was basically a wrapper around another application called Hub, which effectively provided a CLI tool for working directly with GitLab. Now, Hub was a tool for working with GitHub, so a lot of the functionality that was provided by it didn't actually work in a GitLab context. So I thought, why don't I go and just try out the Hub tool directly and see how well it works on GitHub? And that's what we're going to be doing today. So before you actually get to testing anything, the first thing you might want to do is make sure that Hub is going to be using the correct protocol. So I think by default, it's going to be using the Git protocol, but I know a lot of people like to use SSH or like to use HTTPS. So if you run this command right here, so git config dash dash global hub dot protocol, and then just pass in whichever protocol you want to use. So by default, it's on Git, but you can set it to HTTPS or you can set it to SSH. I'm just going to be using HTTPS just because I haven't set up my SSH keys with GitHub, but I would recommend using SSH if you've actually gone and actually done that configuration. So if we just run that, I've already done that off camera, so nothing actually changes, but it shouldn't show anything anyway. If it does fail out, that means you type the protocol name in wrong. So the first thing you probably want to do is actually go and clone something. Now, the nice thing about Hub is every single command in Git can actually be passed directly through it. So anything that isn't wrapped by Hub basically will just get passed to Git. Now, anything that is wrapped by Hub is gonna add some nice functionality that just makes it a little bit easier to work with. So for example, if we do Hub clone, what we can do is actually clone like this. So we can say we wanna clone something from Brody Robertson slash dot files, and that's actually going to clone this repo that's on my GitHub. So if we go and clone that now, as you're gonna see, we don't have to know the GitHub URL or anything like that. If we just know the name of the repo and the name of the author, basically we can go and download it like that. And that makes it so much easier to actually go and download the code. Now, when you actually do download it like that, it obviously like with a clone normally, it will make sure that your remote is set up correctly. So if I do git config dash dash get remote dot origin dot URL, as you can see, the remote URL is set up correctly, but sometimes you don't actually want to clone something. Sometimes you want to go and init a new repo. So if we try this out instead, so hub init dash G. Now dash G is actually very important. So what that's going to do is make sure it actually sets a remote for us. If we go and set a folder name, let's say we want to set a folder called, I don't know, test folder. As you're going to see, it goes and makes that repo. And if we actually go into the test folder and run that command from just before, as you can see, it's actually gone and set that remote for us. Now, it hasn't actually made that repo on my GitHub. So if this repo doesn't exist, obviously you won't be able to use it before you actually go and make it. But if the repo does already exist and you're just trying to init a repo on your system, this is an easy way to go about doing that. So let's try out something a little bit different. So right here, I have a new Git repo and this one doesn't actually have a remote attached to it. So what if you wanted to go and add one to it? The way you would do that with Git is you do Git remote add origin and then you have to write out whatever the URL for it's going to be. But that's way too much to write out. So with hub, what you can do is hub remote add origin. And what this is going to do is create a remote named origin and the URL for it is going to be based on the use that you're logged into hub with slash the name of the folder that you're in. So if we just go and run this now, no output is good. And we go and run that git command from just before. As you can see, the remote is now set to Brody Robertson slash test folder. Now, obviously, like with the previous command, if this remote doesn't actually exist, you can't actually push to it. So another thing that you can do is go and pull in commits from a GitHub pull request. If you wanted to do this just using Git, basically what you would have to do is go download a patch file using something like curl, and then you can apply the patch using Git AM. But with this, you can do it all in just one step. But it's not as nice as some of the other commands inside of Hub, because this one, as you can see here, you have to pass it a URL. Now, because you pass it a URL, you can technically pull in commits from a different repo. Don't do this because it's probably going to break everything, but you can do it. So this is really annoying. I would like to see it so you can just pass in the number for the pull request, but it's okay, I guess. So if we go and run this now, 
as you're going to see, it's going to fail. So if I just do git am dash dash abort, that will then get us back to the state we were just in. And the same will apply to checkout as well. Basically, that will let you check out the head of a pull request. And once again, that one you also have to pass in a URL rather than just passing the number of the pull request. And then you also have the hub merge command, which basically does the same thing. So hub merge, and then you'd pass in the URL of the pull request you want to merge. So instead of having to run fetch and then merge, basically you're just doing this in one step. And the last wrap command I want to talk about is push. So if you want to push to multiple remotes with git, you would have to do git push, the name of the remote, the name of the branch. Git push, the name of the remote, the name of the branch. And you'd have to do that for every single one you want to push to. This is a little bit easier though. So if we just do hub push, and we say we want to push to remote A, to remote S, to remote D, to remote F, and we want to push branch master. That's all we have to do. That will then push it to all four of those remotes and we don't have to think about anything else. Now, there are actually other commands that are wrapped by hub. So I think there's a wrapper for things like cherry pick. And as you can see, there's a wrapper for fetch and rebase. But I don't really feel like talking about those in this video. If you want to go try them out for yourself, then they are always here for you to try out. So moving on to the new commands, you can probably see there's a couple of things in here that might actually be kind of useful. So things like hub API or hub create, delete, fork, so on and so forth. So I'm not going to go through all of them, but I will go through most of them. So hub API basically will let you access the low level GitHub API. So anything that you can normally do with the GitHub API can be done through this. I would recommend either reading the GitHub documentation on the API or having a look at the man page for hub-api, and this will give you most of the information that you're going to want to know. Now, I'm not going to go through most of this because a lot of this is sort of repeat stuff from curl, because everything you can do with hub-api can also be done with curl, but I will run something. If we just run hub-api user, this is going to get us all the information about my user. So the user I'm currently logged in with in GitHub is Brody Robertson. Now, another useful one at least when a hub can't do everything you need it to do, is hub browse. So hub browse is basically going to open up the Git repo you have open inside of GitHub. So if you don't have a remote attached to it, this command won't work. But assuming you do, what it's going to do is open up that repo on the GitHub side. Now, most things you don't need to go to this for, but when it comes to doing things like commenting on issues, commenting on pull requests, or some of the more advanced repo management stuff. Some of that stuff actually does have to be done from your web browser, but most of the general things can just be done from hub. So another use for this is if we do hub browse dash u, this will actually get us the URL for the GitHub repo. So as you can see, that's the URL right there. If we go and click on that, that will then go and open up the same thing. So if you need to send the URL to someone for whatever reason, that's a quick way to get it. Now an important command to have is hub create. So one thing to keep in mind, when you actually do create a repo with hub create, it will be created as public by default. So just keep that in mind. So if we just run a hub create and don't pass anything into it, what it's going to do is take the name of my user and take the name of the folder and go and create a remote like that. But if we go and pass in some input that it can't actually handle, it will actually show us the options. But as I've been showing throughout this video, the best way to actually get any information about hub is to go and look at the man page for any of the options. So hub dash create. As you can see, you can set it to a private repo with the dash P option. You can set a description with dash D. You can set a home page. You can set a remote name, so on and so forth. So what we're going to do is just run hub create dash P to make it private dash D to set a description. So this is a description. And if we go and just run this command now, as you're going to see, it's going to create a remote called test folder. Now, if we just go run hub browse, as you will see, it's going to open up that repo inside of GitHub. And as you can see, there's also nothing in here. So let's actually go and remove the repo now. So to delete the repo, all we have to do is just run hub delete and then we also have to pass in the name of the repo. I guess this is just to make sure that you are 100% sure about which repo that you're actually deleting. Now, when you run this, it's probably going to fail. So run this now. 
because when you first go and set up your login for Hub, it's going to set up a very, very restrictive access token. So if you want to go and change this, you have to go into your token settings and then make sure that that token actually has the correct access. So if we go into this one here and then change this to have access to, what is it, delete repo. So delete repo, this one here. So tick that one and then update token. If we go back to this and try to run it again, yes, now it is successful. The reason why it's like this is to make sure the token doesn't have access to everything on your account in case that you didn't actually make it yourself. So we can also go and fork an application. Right now I'm in the source code for the application we're actually looking at. And if we just run hub fork, what that's gonna do is go and create a fork on your account for this repo. So let's just run that. Give that a second to go. Updating my account. It says everything has been made. If we just run hub browse now, it should take us over to my version of hub. And as you can see, we are now in the Brady Robertson version of hub. So that's how easy it is to fork using hub. So to end off the video, let's just mess around with some pull requests and some issues. So right now I'm back in my dot files repo. If we just run the hub PR command, what that's going to do is not really much. It's going to tell us that we're running it wrong. So hub PR requires an extra sub command. And as you can see, there's no create here. The reason why create isn't here is because create is on a separate command. I don't know why pull request create is on a separate command, but it is. So hub PR is just for managing your pull requests. So if we go and run hub PR list, as you will see, that lists out all of my pull requests. If I go hub PR show, and then we can say show number eight, that will show the information about the eighth pull request. And that's going to show you in your actual browser. Now, there's no reason why this has to be in your browser. So I'm not really sure why it's done like this because issues are shown in your terminal. So I'm sure there's a reason for that, but this one is going to get shown in your browser. And then we can go and run hub PR checkout and then whatever pull request we want to check out. So in this case, we'll check out pull request number eight. As you can see, we're now on that pull request there. So as I mentioned earlier, a pull request is done with the hub pull request command. So once again, I don't know why it's not on PR, but anyway, if we just run hub pull dash request with no arguments, basically what that's gonna do is create a pull request based on the branch that we're currently on, and then it's gonna open up our editor to basically let us put in some information about the pull request itself. Now I'm not going to do this because this is an actual repo I maintain, and that's gonna be a little bit annoying to deal with. But if you go and put in a message there, it will actually work successfully. As you can see, it does actually abort if you don't give it a title, which is really nice. There are so many applications like this which don't abort if you quit out of the editor, and I don't know why they work like that. There's also a bunch of arguments you can use to modify your pull request as you're actually creating it. So if we just look at the man page for that for just a moment, so hub pull dash request, as you'll see, you can go and set a message. If we scroll down a bit, you can go set you can go set a reviewer, you can go set who it's assigned to, you can set the milestone labels, you can set it as a draft, so on and so forth. But as you can see, there's some examples of how to use it down here as well. So if you want to try any of these out, then you can come check these out. And the last command we have is hub issue, which works a little bit differently to the way that hub PR works. So with hub PR, we had to run hub PR list. This one, we can just run hub issue and this will print stuff out. So I don't know why those are different. I would either have them both with the list command or have neither with the list command. I don't know why they work differently like that because hub issue actually does have sub commands as well. So man, hub dash issue. As you can see, there's a show, create, update, labels, and transfer. So all of this stuff still does exist here. But when you just run a hub issue with no arguments, it can be very easy to miss because it is actually printing everything out without any sub arguments. If you are planning to use this, it is entirely safe to go alias hub to git because every single command in git, if it's not being handled by hub, will just be passed directly to it. So you won't actually lose out on any functionality. The only problem you might start to see is 
there might be some things that depend on GitHub. So if you are using, say, GitLab or you are using SourceForge or anything like that, there might be some problems there. But if you're only working on GitHub, it's going to be entirely safe to just run every single Git command just as a hub command. So for example, I didn't show you this one earlier, but you could run like hub status or that Git command that we we're running earlier. So if we just do hub config dash dash get remote dot origin dot URL. As you can see, even though config isn't being wrapped by hub, it is still getting passed directly through to it. And if there's anything you're unsure about with hub, the documentation for it is actually exceptional. So if we just run, say, man hub dash am, what you're going to see is it shows us what the hub command is, and then it also shows us what the equivalent version with just regular git would be. So let's try another one. Let's try, say, uh, man hub dash merge. As you can see, here is the hub command, and here is the two git commands you'd have to run to do the exact same thing. So basically everything that hub can do is going to be described in this documentation pretty well, and it makes it so much easier to learn how to use this application. So I think that's basically everything I wanted to say. Now, obviously this isn't perfect. It is still missing basically only comment. And that's the only thing that I can think of that's missing. So you can't comment on things like issues or pull requests. And I guess there's some more of the high level administration stuff that can't be done. But a lot of that stuff you'd probably prefer to do from the browser anyway. You could technically make it work on a terminal, but some of the stuff is going to be a little bit too complex to make work in a terminal interface. So I might end up just replacing git with hub or I guess aliasing hub to git and then just passing all of the commands that don't work in hub directly to git and just work from that because most of my stuff is on GitHub anyway. I do have a GitLab, but I never actually use it just because I think the GitHub profile just looks a little bit better. So I think that's pretty much everything for me. But before I go, I would like to thank my supporters. So a special thank you to Joachim Corbinian, Craig, Nathan, Andrew, Montezar, Joseph, Peter D. Rowe, Tony Donald, John Marrick, Mc Mikkel, Spigeen, Tais, and Zilva. If you want to go support my work, there'll be some links down below, as well as links to my podcast, which is Tech of a Tea, available on many platforms like Library and YouTube for the video version and the audio version available anywhere you listen to audio podcasts. Also remember to go check out this channel available on Library, BitChute, BitChute, and a bunch of other platforms as well. And remember to go smash the like button and leave me a comment down below. And remember to subscribe and ding the little bell icon down below as well. So I think that is pretty much everything for me and... I'm out.